Okay, looks like the numbers have stabilized, so we'll, we will move on. So welcome to the July 3rd meeting at the Ottawa Centre of the RESC. Special welcome to those who are visiting from other RESC centres and, uh, and to guests that are visiting with us here this evening. We've got an exciting meeting planned for you, but first of all, I've got a couple of Zoom things. So the next slide, please, Chris. So just a couple of little security things here. Um, Sometimes people will sign up for a session and then they will put uh, bad links in the chat and then and try to encourage other people to click on them. Uh, the, while the chat is open, we're not gonna be monitoring it, but if at any point in the chat, somebody happens to put a link, uh, a, a network link in there, please do not click on that for your safety. If you have a question for the presenter, please use the Q&A box and uh, you will not be able to raise your hands. I believe we have disabled that. And uh, that is about it. As a, as a, uh, as a participant in this, uh, you will not be able to share video or talk. So the best way to communicate with us is via Q&A. Next slide, please. Okay, so my name is Dave Chisholm. I'm the meeting chair for the local center. Um, I've got a few things up front with myself. So the, you've got the introduction, 10 minute astronomy news. We have the Ottawa skies for July. I'm really excited to have Jeremy back to tell us how he photographs all the auroras and uh, make sure you get your questions ready for him. Uh, we're doing something a little bit different tonight. I put out a poll to get various tips and tricks uh, and, and I have a bunch of different speakers here tonight to share some of their tips and tricks, and I think you'll quite enjoy that. And we got some amazing observations again uh, this evening. We should be done by midnight. No, hopefully we'll be done <laughs> between 9.30 and 10. That's, that's our target anyways. Okay, next slide, please. Welcome to our new members. We have uh, 29 new members so far in 2020. And in the last month, we've had uh, Daniel Fallon, uh, Robert Gagnon, and David Melkin. So welcome. Okay, 10 minute astronomy news. Okay, so next slide, please. Okay, so this, this article uh, where, I, where I extracted this uh, from was uh, originally appeared in uh, Vice USA and I thought it was quite interesting, uh, some of the things that people come up with. Um, the far side of the moon is a land of quiet mystery because it always faces away from the earth. All the noisy radio transmissions that we humans blast out never reach the far side of the moon. Scientists have dreamed of capitalizing on this unique radio silence for decades. And NASA has, has now brought that vision one step closer to reality by funding a proposal to build a radio telescope inside a crater on the far side of the moon. The proposed observatory would be one kilometer in diameter, making it the largest failed aperture radio telescope in our solar system, according to the NASA abstract about the concept. Called the Lunar Crater, Radio Telescope, or the LCRT. The proposal is the brainchild of Septarshi Bandio Padahai, a robotics technologist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Last April, LCRT was selected for initial phase one funding by NASA of $125,000 through their NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts Program, which aims to explore advanced far future technologies. LCRT is still in its very early stages of development, said uh, Bandio Padahai in an email, noting that the objective of phase one is to study the feasibility of the concept. We'll be mostly focusing on the mechanical design of the LCRT, searching for suitable craters on the moon, and comparing the performance of LCRT against other ideas that have been, pro that have been proposed in literature. Bandio Padahai envisions building the LCRT in a crater that measures about three to five kilometers in diameter. The telescope's wire mesh scaffolding would be delivered and erected by wall climbing robots, such as NASA's do axle rovers, which would be capable of scaling the vertical slopes of the crater. So I'm gonna show you a couple of slides of, of what his concept is. First of all, these are the NASA dual axle rovers. There's four wheels on here. This is just sort of a side view. Top uh, uh, picture shows you it in its standing and moving position, and then uh, in its uh, anchor position at the bottom. The, the wheels have got a fairly deep uh, teeth so that they can climb up and down the craters fairly easily. Next slide. So the idea is that uh, they would deploy two packages to the moon, 
one would be into the center of the crater and the other one would be at the uh, at the top of the crater which would contain the dual axle um, rovers next slide so when the lander uh, arrives it then deploys uh, guide wires you'll see on this picture here that there's some red ones and some blue ones so the red ones will uh, contain the receiver that's going to be hanging over the uh, the top of the crater and the blue ones are each attached to wire mesh so next one so the dual, the dual axle uh, rovers descend into the crater grab the wire and then pull it back up to the top as per the next slide there they're showing them pulling up the mesh. And then finally, the, the next slide. This is what it looks like when it's uh, fully put together. So the LCRT uh, would be a filled aperture radio telescope or a spherical reflector, meaning that it uses one full dish to collect radio data as opposed to radio arrays that are made of many network dishes. Currently, the largest filled aperture radio telescope ever built is the 500 meter aperture spherical radio telescope called FAST in southwest China. LCRT would be twice as big as FAST and would have much more, a much more conducive environment for radio astronomy. Not only would this telescope avoid all the radio interference produced by humans, it would also be observing the universe without the veil of an atmosphere. Earth's atmosphere is quite useful for keeping us all alive, but also blocks many wavelengths of light from reaching ground-based observatories, including low-frequency wavelengths that exceed 10 meters. An ultra-long wave radio telescope on the far side of the moon has a tremendous advantage compared to Earth-based and Earth-orbiting telescopes, Vandio Padahai said in his proposed abstract. The LCRT could enable tremendous scientific discoveries in the field of cosmology by observing the early universe in the 10 to 50 meter uh, wavelength band, that's the six to 30 megahertz frequency bands, which has not been explored by humans to date. In particular, the telescope could shed new light on the mysterious processes that occurred more than 13 billion years ago as the first stars in the universe were being born. It could also examine and find details about exoplanets that orbit other stars. While these science goals are extremely exciting, Badi Opatahai also looks forward to the engineering challenges inherent in such an ambitious concept. As a roboticist, I'm personally most interested in enabling such science measurements using the best robotics technologies available to us. In addition to the LCRT, NASA also granted initial funding to more than a dozen other futuristic missions, including swarms of gravity hoppers that could explore small celestial bodies and an antimatter braking system for interstellar travel. So that's our 10 minute astronomy news. Moving on, we're gonna look at the Ottawa skies for July. So uh, next slide, please. Okay, so here are the moon phases. Uh, we have a full moon. Uh, full moon is tonight, there we go. This is known as the full buck moon because the male buck deer would begin to grow their antlers at this time of the year. So also, this moon has also been known as the full thunder moon and the full hay moon. Next slide. Okay, so we have uh, two comets that uh, we have up there right now. Uh, we have Comet Neowise, which is a retrograde comet with a near parabolic orbit. It was discovered on March the 27th uh, by the Neowise Space Telescope. It will pass closest to the sun on July the 3rd, so it's already done that. Um, as of the 10th of June, it was magnitude seven, and if it survives perihelion, that's its closest approach to the sun, it's expected to be visible to the naked eye in July. The comet will be less than 20 degrees from the sun from the, from the 11th of June until the 9th of July. So it's very difficult to see right now. Closest approach to the Earth will be on the 23rd of July at a distance of 0 0.69 astronomical units. It's best visible in the dawn above the northeast horizon after the July 4th, and it could reach magnitude one at that point. It is, however, very low in the horizon. Okay, the next one. So Comet Lemon, this is a new one uh, that I just found out about. And it makes its initial appearance low in the western sky around July 4th in Sextons, and gradually ascends crossing the rich Virgo cluster of galaxies at mid-month before reaching Coma Bernices at month end. Uh, the comet passed per perhelion on June the 18th and swung closest to the Earth at 124 million kilometers on June the 29th. This one has been mostly visible in the Southern Hemisphere, so it's just getting up north now. Like Neowise, it will slowly fade, I mean, by about 
five magnitudes uh, during July. This is a map of where this is. For those of you who are on our distribution list, this will be an astronauts. So you will be able to, to look back at this. Next slide, please. This is a, a picture that somebody captured of Comet Lemon from the uh, Southern Hemisphere. Looks uh, pretty cool. Okay, next slide. Okay, we have the Delta Aquarids meteor shower, July 28th and 29th. Appears to be radi radiating from Aquarius. Uh, it's an average meteor shower, 20 meteors uh, per hour at the most. Um, the second quarter moon will block many of the fainter meteors this year. But if you're patient, you should be able to catch a few of the brighter ones. The best viewing will be from a dark location after, mid uh, after midnight. Meteors will appear to radiate from the constellation Aquarius, but can appear anywhere in the sky. Next slide. Well, uh, we've go gone past the longest day of the year. So as you can see, the sun is now setting, uh, starting to set a little bit earlier by towards the end of the month which is uh, great for us. It means we don't have to stay up quite so late. Next slide. So Mercury, uh, we have the greatest Western elongation on July the 22nd. That means it's uh, furthest away from the sun. So you'll be able to see it in the Eastern sky just before sunrise on the 22nd of July. And I'm just gonna pause here for a second and see I've got a couple of questions. Oh, did, that, did I put up the June calendar? Okay. Thought I had the July calendar up there. Anyways, we will make sure that we have the, it uh, appears as though the June calendar was displayed there. I apologize for that. Um, anyways, uh, talking about meteors, could a virus come from an asteroid or meteor inside of it if it were to land on the Earth? Uh, probably not, because it gets superheated as it comes into the Earth and anything that, that would be alive would be uh, completely wiped out by the, the intense heat. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So Venus is visible uh, before sunrise. It was uh, the last couple of months we can see it in the evening. Uh, Mars is also visible uh, before sunrise, but you can see towards the end of the month, it's coming up at 11.20. So uh, next month, we'll be able to watch for Mars in the evening sky. Next slide. Jupiter, visible in the evening and through the night. So uh, July 1st, it, it was rising at 9.38. By the end of the month, it's gonna be rising at 7.27. So. Uh, it's going to be at opposition closest to the Earth on July the 14th. Next slide. Saturn is visible in the late evening and through the night. By the end of the month, it'll be uh, visible uh, in the in, in reasonable hours, and it's at opposition on July the 20th. Next one. Uranus is visible before sunrise. Neptune is visible also before sunrise. And there is our cartoon of the month. So thank you very much, folks. We're going to turn it over to uh, Jeremy. Um, so we're just gonna switch uh, slides here for a second. Thanks, Dave. I'm gonna try sharing uh, my screen and seeing how that works. Okay, I'm just going through sharing. I just put it on uh, the newest version of Mac OS and it is very security conscious. So I'm just having to click a few uh, soul searching questions from the OS about sharing my screen here. But they should do it. Yeah, it's coming up. Okay, great. Can you see my uh, keynote presentation here if I hit play? Yep, looks good. All right, let's get started. I think we have about half an hour and we'll, we'll try and do any questions. I want to say, uh, first of all, thanks to uh, Dave and Chris for the opportunity to sort of append a part two to the presentation that we did on an overview of, of the Aurora back in 
back in April. Uh, we had a good time presenting that and uh, wanted to do something that focused a little bit more on the photography of it. So there's there's a link down there, a tiny URL link to part one, which is on the uh, Rask Ottawa uh, YouTube channel. Uh, I wanted to do part two uh, from the perspective of a new Aurora photographer, somebody who is maybe familiar with astrophotography uh, and and is going on their first trip somewhere where they have a really good chance of seeing the aurora. And that somewhere is usually Canada. Uh, and, and maybe they don't have specialized equipment. Maybe they don't know a lot about it, but it, if they looked at this presentation, they would walk away with sort of some steady feet where they would know what equipment to bring, know where to set it up and know how to get a few good pictures. So first of all, happy Canada day, give or take a few days. Uh, I think of the aurora as sort of the official fireworks display of Canada. Uh, tried to make something that looked a little bit like the Canadian flag here, if you can see that. Uh, and it came from this picture, which was taken up in the Yukon. Uh, people often see shapes in the aurora, and you, it's almost like cloud watching or, uh, or ink blot tests. Uh, this one, people said they saw a dragon or an angel or something. And so uh, if you can anthropomorphize your photos, people like them. I guess that's why so many uh, nebulae tend to be named after animals or why we have uh, why we have constellations uh, too. Uh, why aurora photography? Why do we do it from the perspective of astrophotography? I'm not a astrophotography uh, expert. I joined RASC a year ago and I'm very much still learning everything there is to learn from the wonderful members here. And I like to think of astrophotography as kind of like a fast forward or a aurora photography as a fast forward version of astrophotography, meaning you're getting the full gambit of plasmas, uh, shock waves, um, interstellar or stellar material emissions lines, uh, sorry, emission lines from, from uh, active molecules and atoms. You even have sort of a foreground planet that happens to have a breathable atmosphere. Um, it's all here for you to photograph and it moves quickly and it changes every night. In fact, if you go to the same place two nights in a row with Aurora, um, you will not be getting the same picture as somebody else uh, as, as you would with say uh, a planet or, or um, a galaxy or a nebula, it, your, your aurora, if it's even taken a few seconds later, a few fractions of a second later, will be totally unique. It'll be as unique as a fingerprint. Uh, so, so you can go to uh, get aurora in the same place multiple times and always come away with something new and different and exciting. And finally, there's not a big barrier to entry for equipment, especially these days with the very good cameras, the very good sensors, the very good entry level lenses. You probably, if you are uh, somewhat of a photography enthusiast, already have great enough equipment. And even this past year, people have been taking a lot of photos with the new photo modes on, or the new night mode on uh, the latest iPhones and, and other Android phones. They can do pretty good night photography of the Aurora. Finally, Canada is kind of one of the capitals of Aurora. There's some great locations here. And international travel might be a bit hard for the next while. So why not stick around Canada and try an Aurora photography uh, vacation? Now, Aurora photography, because everything moves so fast, is kind of a hybrid. There is astrophotography in that you're out in the dark with a camera. And you really need to know your camera inside and out. It also means quite a bit of planning. You need to know where the buttons are. You need to have your uh, headlamp ready. You need to not be tripping over your coffee that you set down just next to you, uh, especially early in the evening when it's still warm. It's also like landscape photography. The Aurora, you're not shooting a particular uh, easily recognizable planet or, or galaxy or nebula. What you're shooting is gonna be unique. And therefore, what you want to have is an anchored foreground that people can relate to really brings them into the picture. And for that reason, it is like landscape photography. And you have to be conscious of composition of trees, of lakes, of grass, of mountains, of old barns, uh, and, and really think about putting people in a place in this sort of alien set of light that they're otherwise looking at. Finally, it's like wildlife photography. It is going to move fast after hours of waiting. Uh, and it's a bit unpredictable too. You can be there on the right night, but you don't know what direction necessarily it's going to come out. Uh, you don't know exactly when. It's, it's usually when you're warming up your hands. It's usually when you're making yourself another cup of coffee. You just have to be ready and, and make sure luck is on your side. Fortunately, this is not us. Um, 1892, glass plates, getting the first Aurora photos uh, in, in Norway. 
and even in 1953, the first color photos were done on on large four by five medium format cameras, and and the the ISO values and the the lens capabilities were not there to get great photos like we can now. So we're living in sort of a golden age of getting really good photography without a huge investment in lugging uh, glass plates all over the Arctic. Uh, to understand what you're photographing, it's a good idea to sort of know the animal. If you're going to go on a vacation to photograph, say, lions somewhere, polar bears somewhere, you want to know a bit about their behavior, their shape. Which part is the front of the bear? Which is the back? How big are they? So I thought we'd start with a little bit of aurora taxonomy. So if you think of it as sort of an animal, what would that animal be like? Uh, what color is it? What shapes is it? Uh, and what behavior does it have? So we'll just quickly go over that to really understand the animal that we're photographing. Starting with color. Uh, somebody stated this to me recently. I didn't really think of it that way until now. But as you can see, the aurora is an atmospheric phenomena that takes place from about 80 to 400 kilometers up. And, and it is excited electrons primarily uh, filtering down through the atmosphere following magnetic lines of force and interacting with uh, nitrogen and oxygen, both molecular and oxygen and, and atomic uh, species, which then uh, re-emit at specific frequencies. And those are emission lines, basically. They're not absorption lines. It's, it's not reflection off of anything. But what you're getting is green. You're getting some blues and violets. You're getting some reds and oranges. Well, what is that? That's that's RGB, and that's the same thing that all of our computer monitors have for pixels. We have RGB pixels. What that really means is that you could be dealing with almost any color in the aurora if they, if they mix in the right way or you get them from the right perspective. They're predominantly green for us. You'll get some really beautiful magenta fringes along the very bottom of them that move rapidly when there's a lot of activity. And if you have a long exposure or it's far away on the horizon, you'll see these deep reds above the green higher in the atmosphere. But those can mix in almost any way, and you'll also see yellows, you'll see white, and you'll see almost everything in between. And that's just the nature of it being an RGB kind of phenomena. Uh, that was sort of a two-dimensional view, but the aurora are sort of famous for having forms, uh, shapes. And the, the sort of basic building block of the shape of the aurora is the curtain. You can think of this as a straight, very long curtain and it's not quite understood why um, electrons filter down through the atmosphere in this curtain shape. It's not quite solved. Uh, it's open research question. But they're very long. They're thousands of kilometers long, and they're very narrow relative to that. So you think about those stories about the rings of Saturn, how amazingly thin they are. Aurora kind of fall into that classification of having that thousand to one width to length ratio. An aurora curtain is very thin, and when it's very quiet, it doesn't have a lot of undulations into it. Uh, so it really depends the perspective you're looking at it, whether it's edge on, underneath it at a 45 degree angle, you're seeing something different. But think of it really as a literal curtain in terms of its form, shape, and ratio, and also its behavior. These curtains are made of charged particles, and they self-interact within the, the sort of electromagnetic uh, situation that they're in as they come down through the atmosphere. What this means is they are unstable to a, a degree. When you start pumping extra energy into these quiet, straight, narrow curtains, they start to curl around themselves, and that becomes a positive feedback loop. And there's two kinds of curls that you'll see, and you'll not really see the first kind, which is a curl. It's only a few kilometers in diameter, and you see that as a bright ray in the aurora, almost like a vertical streak of brighter light. So think of it like a, a kink in the curtain. And there's also a bigger species that's this spiral where it starts to spiral in on itself. And those you can really see because they can be a thousand kilometers across. So one manifests as changes in brightness, the other actually manifests as changes in shape. Here's an example of one of those, actually both of those phenomena where you see sort of bright rays throughout this image, you're seeing those smaller curls a few kilometers across that come and dissipate very rapidly. And this large curl or, uh, or this large spiral is, is that uh, second kind that's over a thousand kilometers across. I caught this in 
in the Yukon and was just amazed at how well this represented the diagrams you see in the books. It's not often you see that sort of ideal shape. This only lasted for a few seconds with this kind of symmetry, but it's very beautiful. So it represents both the kind of shapes that a curtain can twist itself into. Finally, think of it as a curtain blowing in the wind. They do wrinkle onto each other with, with extra energy, almost like a, a river. If you imagine a river over thousands of years or hundreds of years, it creates meanders and it piles up on itself. The aurora curtains will do that too over the course of seconds and minutes. When you're looking right under them, you'll see these sort of uh, curtains pile up on themselves, just like you were standing under a real curtain. Uh, when you're looking straight up at them, they seem to emanate everywhere from the magnetic zenith. And those are called corona, like a crown, because it feels like you're wearing a crown of light as it comes down all around you. So if you're directly under the aurora, you really have this amazing perspective right over your head. And that's why so many aurora chasers go up to where they can see the aurora right overhead as opposed to a phenomena on the horizon. Finally, in the early morning, especially, you'll get diffuse aurora. This is when the curtains... I've heard it described as the curtains are kind of ragged and have torn up. Uh, so you could almost imagine this picture of, of early morning diffuse aurora. They're kind of like little fragments that have been pushed and pulled all around and they're no longer connected anymore. Uh, sometimes these will pulse as well and you'll see pulsing aurora uh, where the whole sky will kind of like zebra stripes or like a octopus or a cuttlefish uh, almost pulsate in unison. It's very beautiful and it's because it's diffuse, you can also get a lot of stars in the background too because it's not this bright, overwhelming phenomenon. So that's the taxonomy. Those are the forms you'll see, the straight curtains, the curling curtains, and this diffuse breakup. And there's other kinds too that you may have heard of like Steve and most recently the Dunes Aurora, which I won't touch on too much here. Uh, we're talking about sort of the main forms that you'll see most often. Uh, finally, you wanna know an animal's behavior. So what is the behavior of the Aurora? This is from the Astronomy North Outreach website. It, it shows that the aurora really appears in, a, in sort of a donut around the geomagnetic north and south poles. And this is the Canadian perspective. What we're seeing is, depending on the aurora uh, or the KP activity, think of that kind of like the Richter scale of geomagnetic activity. It's even kind of semi-logarithmic too, like uh, six is 10 times more than five in terms of activity. As you see it grow from one, which is very quiet conditions, all the way up to six, which is a, a G2, a geomagnetic storm that's fairly strong, you'll see that more and more cities in Canada will be able to see the aurora either overhead or well above the horizon. That red line you're seeing north and south of the green means you'll just be able to see it on the horizon if, you're look, if, if that red line crosses over the city you're in. What you might notice is that places like Edmonton and Calgary uh, will we'll see the aurora sometimes with a, um, a KP5 storm. So if you hear, oh, there's a minor geomagnetic storm, you might be able to see it in Edmonton and Calgary or Winnipeg or even Thunder Bay. Uh, places like Ottawa and Toronto, where, where we live, you're going to have to wait for a KP7 to be able to see much of anything. And that doesn't happen too often. But look at places like Yellowknife and Whitehorse. No matter how much the activity changes, those places are almost always under the aurora because they grow as they move south too. So no matter what the conditions, from the very quietest to the most active, you're going to be seeing something up there in Churchill, Yellowknife, or Whitehorse. And that's why they're such popular destinations. You just can't lose in terms of geomagnetic activity and seeing something there. That's not even the case in places like Iceland sometimes where the whole aurora orbital, because of the geometry of the geomagnetic North Pole, it might move south of you. So how often do you see it? Speaking of behavior, how often does this animal come out to play? Well, uh, I grabbed some information here from Aurora Stats, and it's showing on the left, KP5. How many days per year was there a KP5 or stronger uh, geomagnetic activity? And in 2019, last year, one of the quietest years, the solar minimum for, and therefore not a lot of Aurora activity, there were only 13 days out of the whole year where you had a KP5, meaning if you lived in Calgary, there'd only be about 13 days where you'd really see active aurora. Uh, and if you're in Ottawa or Toronto, you need KP7 or more, and you'll see there was only one day in 2019 where we would have even had a chance of seeing aurora down here in Ottawa. However, at the solar sort of maximum, at the peak of the, the last solar cycle in 2015, even in Ottawa, we would have had 15 great nights to see the aurora. So. 
you have to know a bit about the solar cycle. We're in a minimum, but it's starting to build now. And really, you want to go north to see the aurora. Your, your chances of seeing them further south really roll off quickly. Finally, how do the aurora behave sort of overnight? How do they come and go? And this was identified in the 1960s during the geophysical year, 1957, 1958, and then analyzed in the early 60s by somebody named uh, Akasofu. He established a global pattern called the auroral substorm. And you can sort of see the this diagram that he, he drew uh, that, that shows the looking down on Earth from the geomagnetic North Pole. And it shows a ring of aurora, but you see it kind of gets turbulent and builds up. That's the substorm. And it happens over the course of 30 minutes or so, where suddenly the aurora go from these quiet arcs. The arcs start to wrinkle and curl and build up and then fill the sky. And finally, they diffuse into broken up sort of chaotic patterns. Then they settle down again. And the Earth's magnetosphere charges up again. So it's almost like this capacitive discharge phenomena that happens uh, potentially a couple times a night. And you have to be ready for that if you're sitting waiting for the aurora and you see uh, an aurora curtain brightening, you know that something like this is starting up and you've got a few minutes to get your camera gear ready and a few minutes to capture the activity of this substorm. And maybe 30 minutes later, you'll be able to take a, a sip of coffee after it's settled down again. So it's something to keep in mind is this cadence of half an hour, an hour or so of these substorms. Here's what one looks like from the Aurora Max satellite, or sorry, Aurora Max uh, All Sky Camera and Yellowknife. And you can see the, the magnetic activity on the left, and then this sudden flare up of the substorm happening within just a few minutes directly overhead. And if you're not paying attention, you will miss it. If you're on the tour bus and you're driving back to the hotel, you've missed this. You just see it out of the window. Um, so again, it's, it's really like wildlife photography. You have to be ready for it to come out, of, out and play at just the right time. So that's our aurora taxonomy over space and time. Now we sort of understand a little bit about the animal. Now we know how to photograph it. So remember the color, it's like RGB, so anything can happen. Uh, in terms of forms, your relative position and the aurora self-interaction make for sort of an infinite variety. And the behavior, you really have to understand the substorm cycles and follow them through the night. So in terms of photography, I'm not uh, a, a huge expert on this. I've been exploring it a little bit over the last few years. I've really enjoyed it. Um, people like Alan Dyer are, are mentors in terms of the photography uh, skills that go into it. But I want to put together a cookbook of problems and solutions that I've come across in learning and how they might apply to you. And this is often done with programming where you have two manuals for every programming language, the extremely thick manual called the Complete Guide to Something and the very thin prescriptive manual that says, if you've got this problem, here's how to solve it. And those are commonly called cookbooks. And so I thought we'd try this cookbook where we establish a need, like what do you want to accomplish? What options do you have? And what are some tips for success? And we'll go over those for the rest of this presentation. So the first need is to have the highest likelihood of photographing the aurora. And you got to go where they are. Some of the options that uh, work well are northern Norway, uh, so up by Tromsø. That's got a very good tourist sort of support network because it's a large town. Uh, Finland, uh, especially the Lapland area. Iceland, of course, is fantastic for its tourist support. Yellowknife has great tourist support and infrastructure. Whitehorse is beautiful as well for that. Uh, Fairbanks, Alaska, I have not been to, but I understand that's sort of the American destination. And of course, uh, Churchill, Manitoba, they've, there's some access trouble there, but they do have an outreach and science center where people can do sort of learning and photography um, sabbaticals almost. So they, they've got a, a good engagement strategy and it's worth getting in touch with, with the people that do research up there because they're trying to attract photographers. Jeremy? Yes. Okay, so I've got a question here. Um, I, I think I know the answer, but can, can auroras be seen in the Canadian North during summer nights? Oh, that's a really neat question. Um, the, they're always there in every night uh, to a varying degree. Uh, your limiting factors is what is keeping you from seeing them, and that's um, clouds and other light sources. So the clouds, the full moon uh, might cause you trouble. Uh, but most of all, say in places like Yellowknife right now, there is no real darkness. The sun might go a little bit below the horizon, but not by much. Uh, especially in summer. And so you're never really getting dark enough skies. So just like you might not see 
uh, you only see Venus during dusk, for example, or, or very bright stars. Uh, you have the same issue with aurora. They're about the same brightness as, as late dusk. And so if the sun is not setting that far north, you won't see them. Places like Edmonton, you have a better chance, even though the sun there is down by 1130 or so, you'll still have, say, four or five hours of, of good nighttime during the summer. And we used to see them camping in northern Saskatchewan uh, all summer long uh, back in the 80s and 90s. So I hope that answers the question. It really just depends on, on whether the sun is, is, uh, is outshining the aurora for the most part during the summer. Okay, thank you. That's a good question. Um, so the so question or the next thing about the cookbook is, is we imagine going to photograph the aurora and, and you're basically being attacked by polar bears. You've got frostbite, you've run out of spam, uh, and, and your sled dogs are angry at you because you haven't fed them. That kind of, you know, northern explorer perspective doesn't necessarily hold. You do not have to be freezing to death. You can be having a really good time. And maybe this, this sort of answers that question as well. Uh, from August to October in places like Yellowknife and Whitehorse, it is beautiful camping weather. There's no bugs. Um, it, it maybe gets down to zero degrees or five degrees at night. There's magnificent lakes to catch a reflection off of. Uh, Iceland, it never really gets, because it's coastal and you're usually just off the coast, you're always around zero degrees or five degrees at that time. And during the, uh, during the summer months, it's, it's even warmer. So those shoulder seasons of, of uh, March through May or August through October in these areas really works well if you don't want to worry about freezing and, and bringing a lot of clothing and you just want to enjoy hours of photography where you can do a few jumping jacks and stay warm. Uh, Tromsø, Norway is also influenced by, by the, uh, the warm currents from the ocean, so it also stays right around zero all through winter. So those are very comfortable, beautiful places to go, and you, you of course have all the access to the water to see these great reflections and great coastline too. Uh, there's some tips about seeing the aurora, and that is you've got to respect probability here. Unlike, uh, they, they do not obey no Newtonian mechanics. We can't predict where they're going to be uh, without, except for the probabilistics of, of weather, and, and sometimes the forecast is just wrong. A lot of you know, the stereotype you see on Instagram is people waiting for the aurora to come out and then proposing to their loved one under the aurora. Well, if you go to a place where there's only a 25% chance of seeing it within uh, seven nights, you have, during your visit of one week, 87% chance of successfully proposing to your loved one during that time. And, and if you're, uh, I don't know, the other slide is my pun on proposing the other under the aurora. If you're making an executive pr presentation, you wouldn't want to build your entire vacation to go see the aurora under the premise that you're going to see the aurora. You might come away very disappointed. Uh, you should make sure that you're, you've researched your destination. You have a lot of other bucket list items to do, whether it's trying sled dogging, ice fishing, uh, hiking, exploring, uh, seeing some of the local cuisine, meeting the local people and artists. Uh, don't go there thinking that it's going to be 100% success because uh, there's a whole industry about managing uh, expectations around the Aurora and, and don't be taken in by uh, by the fact that if I go north, I'll definitely see it. That's that's marketing, and and you have to really understand the probabilities and make sure that you plan a whole event. And the aurora should just be uh, a great part of it. But certainly, if you don't see them, don't be disappointed. So let's talk about how you do maximize those chances. Fortunately, the world of apps is very dense with uh, capability for you to see. Uh, 28 days ahead, to see three days ahead, to see an hour ahead, and to see real time. Um, your need is really to know when the aurora are going, when the geomagnetic activity is going to be up to see the aurora. Uh, I use an app called Space Weather Live, which is free. It's made by enthusiasts. It's got a lot of interpretive uh, information in it, and I, I consider it my go-to because once you get used to looking for the patterns to see when the aurora emerging, you can, you can map it all the way down to real time. And I won't get into the details of it because there's so much helpful information on the app, but really it's your, it's your dashboard, your eyes and ears into what's happening in the magnetosphere and knowing when the aurora are gonna be coming up from uh, 28 days down to three days down to real time. 
Uh, the other thing is the aurora above the clouds, of course. So you really want to understand what's going on with the clouds. I use the Windy app, which is uh, predominantly for outdoor sports. I think it originally started for sailors and for wind uh, kite surfers, but I'm not sure of that for sure. Um, it's very good for finding holes in clouds, and it does have a lot of uh, a lot of models in it for predicting cloud that you can switch between, and you can see the most pessimistic to the most optimistic because quite often you're looking for holes in the cloud with aurora and saying, is there, can I drive 20 kilometers east and catch the aurora? I, if so, I'm going to try it. We're going to all get in the car and we're going to drive that distance to find that hole in the clouds. And your success can very much depend on coming all the way to some place like Iceland and then just driving that last five kilometers. Uh, People think of aurora photography equals equipment or just about any hobby as being equivalent to the equipment. Uh, I don't want to focus on that too much because the equipment is also good. In the end, you want an interchangeable lens camera to really have success. And the two tiers of pricing that I've seen the most often are full frame, meaning a 35 millimeter uh, sensor on the camera, and APS-C, which is uh, about half the uh, surface area and with half the surface area, you, use, you, you get a little bit more noise in your images, perhaps. But your lenses get smaller, your bodies get smaller, the weight of your rig gets smaller. Everything shrinks by a really convenient amount. And it's worth trading that stop of noise, meaning just a little bit of visible noise, for getting that extra bit of portability. Uh, my big cameras I never bring around with me except when I'm going for Aurora photography. I almost always reach for the small, compact ones. Uh, and it's always something to keep in mind. Your camera isn't just going to be for raw photography. If it just sits in the drawer and it's dedicated, uh, it's not really doing much. So, and it's also half the price, of course. Uh, all your glass, all your lenses are going to be much cheaper and smaller. Uh, and everything about it is, is just going to scale down in a nice way. So here, here's sort of my kit laid out on a table. You'll see a passport, hand warmers, coffee, chargers, an intervalometer, a good tripod, headphones to listen to music, uh, lots of chocolate to keep your calories and body temperature up, uh, and, and two cameras, a small one for, for portability and, and then the big one with its giant lens. And we'll go over some of these components here. So if you need a compact travel camera and you want good image quality for night photo photography and a reasonable price and plenty of lenses, you really can't go wrong with any of the big name APS-C camera bodies and that APS-C is just the terminology for the size of the sensor uh, and you just make sure it has a lens mount where you can put different lenses on it it's just a great middle ground for price performance uh, Fuji uh, makes incredible cameras um, the Canon EOS M50 I really like using in the top right Sony makes some of the best sensors in terms of signal to noise ratio uh, in the lower left like the A6000 series and Nikon they're they're just used to building cameras that work so well in harsh conditions and then everything from their beginner 5000 series on up is, is just ergonomically fantastic for people to use. There, there's a need to shoot all evening. You're going to be out all night and you're going to take 500 or 1000 images with Aurora because they move so much and you really want to capture that motion. You never know what's coming next. So think of this as doing a lot of uh, intervalometer uh, photography and you're going to want to not have your batteries run out or freeze. Uh, for me that means keeping multiple batteries in warm places. You don't keep them in some place cold because lithium-ion batteries and the cold just do not mix. Um, they can stay warm if they're running in your camera. You don't turn off your camera but the other ones you keep in your pocket, your warmest pocket that you have inside your jacket. Outside pockets aren't, aren't warm enough. Uh, you might want to use really big battery packs or external battery packs. And quite frankly, you might want to get lots of hockey tape. I have pink shown here because black hockey tape is invisible at night. And you're going to want to tape those little hot pockets that you can buy for the inside of your gloves and boots to the parts of the camera where the, uh, where the batteries are. And that's just extra insurance to keep all of that warm. And generally, that really comes into play when you're getting below minus 15 or minus 20 degrees. Uh, but even so, you want to keep your battery life uh, as, as, as high as you can because a lot of tripods, it's hard to change the battery when the camera is on the tripod. So those are some options for power. Uh, hockey tape, I always think of it as the duct tape of the north because it's designed to work in cold temperatures. It can tape your jacket back together. It can do a, a, a myriad of things with camera equipment in terms of temporarily lashing things together. 
so yeah, hockey, hockey tape definitely is a good Canadian solution to photography situations in the field. You're going to need to attach something to the lens. So the, the need here is you really want to capture a wide swath of sky because so much is happening. There's a wide angle lens as wide as you can get. Uh, people have tried to use, uh, uh, you know, longer focal length lenses because they have them handy. But uh, in general, um, people have been doing this a little bit. They, they say, I'm going to invest in a nice wide lens. You also want a really short exposure time because the aurora moves so much and so rapidly potentially. And finally, you're always focusing to infinity. Um, so it doesn't matter if it's autofocus. You really want something that uh, is easy to focus to infinity and you really know how so that everything is sharp from the stars and the aurora on out. Some of the lenses I've listed here, the Laowa 15 millimeter, I think Alan Dyer was using that on his Sony bodies. Uh, the Sigma 14 F, F2.8, Actually, that's, sorry, that's F1.8. That's a typo there. That's one that I've been using this season. It is huge and bulky and really uh, beautiful when it works well. It, it just takes in so much light and it's so wide. It's got autofocus, which you don't need though. And finally, the Rokinon or Samyang 12 millimeter F2. This is for APS-C bodies. They're a third party lens manufacturer. And you'll see a lot of these that make really good manual focus lenses that astrophotographers and aurora photographers love. I really like this Rokinon. I've been using it on my Canon M50 APS-C uh, sensor camera and, and all those cameras I showed before they're APS-C. I think there's a version for them. It's, it's $300. The one below it is $2,000. And yet, if you had two images from them side by side, you'd have to really look at them to tell the difference. And it's also that size difference is real. That's the actual size difference. So again, APS-C I think is really good if, if you're doing Aurora as part of your travel. And, and these third party lenses are really well tailored to what we need to do to get wide and fast uh, photographs. And here's the difference, brighter, brighter lenses mean brighter Aurora. Here's the top left with an F1.4 aperture lens. And then what you might get with a kit lens, the one that comes with a camera at 18 millimeters, it's usually an F3.5 aperture. It's much darker and you have to expose much longer to get a proper brightness and your aurora may have smeared and you've lost some of that fine structure as a result. So brighter really is better. Wider is for drama. The aurora are going to happen in front of you uh, at the horizon and a curtain might come right at you like looking down a, a winding highway. That dramatic uh, perspective is something really worth capturing. To do that you want a wide angle lens. Here's some uh, examples in the still of what, what different focal lengths look like. And you can see that the wider you go, the more you capture, especially that foreground that you want to put in place, but also of the aurora stretching overhead. For APS-C, 11 or 12 millimeters. For full frame, 14 to 16 millimeters. Really works well. You're not looking for accuracy in your framing too. Uh, this is like wildlife photography. You want to be able to have your camera locked down to take lots of photos, but you also want to recompose very quickly. And so uh, Aurora photographers tend to recommend ball head tripods. This is a, a Benro that I use because it's got a single knob that you loosen and you can pivot it any direction, recompose. You can even go from portrait to landscape very quickly. Uh, so uh, you, you can think of it as I can move my camera in any direction rapidly and get the shot I want. And the cameras all have built in leveling tools in them anyway, so you don't have to worry about keeping it level. You're usually on uneven terrain anyway, so a ball head is good for just recomposing, re-leveling, and, and just flipping the camera wherever the action is. An Arca Swiss uh, attachment on it, that's another reason I like Benro, it's not using proprietary connectors, uh, and that interfaces all of your cameras with the tripod. Um, so by using Arca Swiss, you can get the same plate mounted to all your cameras and they can all use that same tripod very easily and arca swiss is very nice to use uh, i find uh, especially in the dark when you're just going by feel um, one of the needs is i just need a good starting point for all the settings on my camera and fortunately every camera has a dial on top and you turn that dial from portrait to macro to that running person uh, and then you turn it to the aurora mode which is right next to the running person uh, Unfortunately, that's not the case. There is no Aurora mode for cameras like there is for sports or for portraits or anything, but we can set up a camera to be like that. 
So you have a memory slot ready. Every camera seems to come with a predefined memory slot. And here's some of the settings for it. Uh, because we're presenting, I won't necessarily get into every one here, but think of having a setting of an ISO 3200, shutter speed of five to 10 seconds, a manual white balance. Um, be ready to know how to focus on infinity to get sharp stars. And most importantly, uh, make sure you're shooting in RAW because then you can always have the most latitude to go back and fix things later uh, when you've got these files on your computer. Intervalometers are, are very important. They're in the camera. They can be on phone apps now. Uh, and you can buy these inexpensive ones like this Pixel Pro Wireless that I've been using this season. This will get your camera taking pictures for you while you're uh, busy doing other things like keeping your hands in your pocket and not getting frostbite or drinking your coffee or not uh, bumping your camera so it's always moving around. You're usually taking photos every 30 seconds, every six seconds around that cadence and having an intervalometer do that for you is really great. I've tried the ones where you use an app to power it and what you'll always find is that cell phones, you have to bring it out to change the settings and battery immediately dies because they're so susceptible to even mildly cold weather. I would not go with app-based camera control because phones are just not designed for that. They, this Pixel Pro with a Bluetooth wireless, it hasn't let me down in, in cold conditions. And you can just keep the transmitter in your pocket. It's wireless. Uh, you can even just activate it, turn it on and off from your car or from your other camera if you're sort of across uh, 100 feet of, of shooting with two cameras. So to get a good time lapse, you really need patience and consistency. And I, I, one of my biggest regrets always went is, is being, uh, having too short of an attention span with the Aurora really start moving. You think, oh, I have not locked down my camera facing the most exciting part of what's going on in the sky right now. So you immediately think I'll recompose and start the intervalometer again and take more pictures. If you've got that mentality, you'll, you'll go back and look at your files and you'll see one file where you're setting up and the camera was jiggling, then a couple photos of, of say some motion, that the, the foreground looks the same and the background's moving and it looks really neat. But then suddenly you'll see your camera perspective jump again because you've decided to recompose. The, the you that's looking at your files later on when you get back to your chip is usually really frustrated by that because you wanted to put together a time lapse or something. So I'd say stick to the composition you've come up with and take at least 30 photos from every composition and then go and move your camera. Don't always be trying to chase that one amazing photo because when you go back and look at your files, you'll see things are jumping all over the place. There's no consistency. Uh, your exposures might be off. Uh, you're just not letting things settle in and really get things working. Uh, finally, when you are doing something like a time lapse, there's so many pieces of software that do that for you automatically. Just make sure that you use a simple crossfade between the images to get the best apparent motion. Don't try and use anything like uh, some of their fancy AI interpolation because you'll start to see uh, stars jumping everywhere and, and, and foreground objects sort of undulating. That's, that's uh, optical flow and AI based uh, methods. You just sit, you stick to simple crossfade and that works best because so much is staying still except for the Aurora. This is a time lapse where I did try and keep the camera steady. I don't know if it'll loop or not. I'll just try and get it to replay or loop or something here. All right, once is good enough. But what you'll see is that I missed a few spots because I set the intervalometer for some reason for 10 pictures and then it stops and I had to start it again. Well, now you have a gap in your, inter, your intervals. That really shows up when you're doing a nice, uh, when you're doing a nice time lapse. So make sure you've got your intervalometer set up to take you know, 999 photos, don't set it to say, take 30 and stop because you don't want to have that gap in the motion. Uh, is the Aurora out right now? Is the sky reasonably clear? Can I just sort of armchair Aurora chase? That's something you do when you're not traveling for them. Fortunately, there's a lot of armchair Aurora chasing that can be done. Aurora Max camera and Yellowknife is one of my favorites. Uh, the Live Aurora Network is a group of enthusiasts putting a7 cameras feeding video into uh, an app and also online. Uh, and they're located all over Norway, Iceland, and I think they're moving to Yellowknife and, and Alaska as well. It's an amazing setup they have uh, for seeing things live. 
Aurora Notify has links to all the Aurora cams that are out there. And I wrote something called the Keogram Explorer that takes the historical database of Aurora Max imagery and lets you explore it. So you can really get a feel for those patterns of substorms that we talked about earlier and get a feel for how the animal of the Aurora behaves. And so when you do go photograph them, you can understand what's going on. If you need community, there's the Alberta Aurora Chasers Facebook group and the Aurora Borealis Notification Group based out of Alaska, I believe, and the Aurora Saurus Citizen Science Group. Uh, they're great communities. They're always willing to answer questions. There's a lot of members all over the world. Some books that you might want to read if you're the kind of person that really wants the travel book. I'd say check out the Amazing Sky Alan Dyer blog posts. He does a lot of trip reports, talks about equipment and technique. He, one of his trip reports was on the, the uh, presentations he does well on a cruise ship on the west coast of Norway. Just amazing stuff uh, and very inspiring and very, very clear outreach. Uh, the Aurora Watchers Handbook is out of print, but quite honestly, it is the, the deepest view into how to understand the Aurora and get good photos of them. Uh, that I've seen. And Melanie Windridge's book about the Aurora and the people that see them is just a neat storytelling uh, event. It's, it's worth bringing with you on your trip because you'll feel sort of immersed in the culture and the science. I don't know how much more time we have, uh, Dave. We're, we're getting, uh, getting tight. Uh, I do have two questions that have come up. Um, first one is, what ISO do you recommend? I, are you going to be coming to that? Like, yeah, I noticed you mentioned uh, 3200, but... Yeah, there... um, the good thing about cameras now is that for the most part, they're I, the sensors are ISO invariant. And all that means is that ISO doesn't mean what it used to. You're not trading off noise to get brighter images. You, If you take a picture and you underexpose it in ISO 800, if you go and boost that and make it brighter later on in Photoshop or Adobe Camera Raw with the raw image, uh, you will uh, be able to recover the same as if you'd shot at ISO 3200 while you were there. And there's a lot more nuance to it without getting into it, but I usually shoot it around ISO 1600 or 3200, and then I just don't worry about it. If you go higher than that, you get out of that realm where the camera really works in its best, uh, its best signal to noise ratio. And if you get too far below that, you're really just not seeing the photos practically on the, on the viewfinder. So 1600, 3200 seems to work well. And if you're shooting video, you might want to go higher than that. And fortunately, the sensors are so good, there's a lot of forgiveness there uh, in, post, uh, in, in post in, say, camera raw. So I hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you. And then the other one is, what causes auroras on Jupiter and Saturn? Uh, the same thing that causes them on Earth. And I guess that's just... Uh, a huge area of research. Uh, you can think of the aurora as sort of the footprint of solar, uh, uh, of space weather, of the connection between all the planets and the sun. Uh, that's an area still under a lot of research right now, but effectively the the mechanism is is similar. I understand on Jupiter though that some of the aurora are actually caused by a different set of particles. That's not completely understood, but effectively any planet that has an atmosphere and a significant magnetic field in the solar system has been witnessed to have aurora. And please correct me on that if, if I'm misstating that. I read it recently. Um, but, but yeah, if the, if the solar wind makes it to your planet and it, can, and it can interact with its magnetosphere and then send energetic electrons down into its atmosphere, you will get some type of aurora. They're not going to be the green ones we see because of the atmosphere and the electron energies. Everything's going to be different. Uh, but they are there and they have been photographed. It's worth checking, say, NASA uh, astro astronomy photo of the day for some really good pictures of that. Okay, so if you could wrap up in the next five or ten, that would be great. Sure, I'll wrap up in the next five minutes. Uh, when you're going up to take pictures of the aurora, there's two ways of doing it, on your own and with a, a sort of turnkey tour group. I usually go it on my own. Uh, I, I, you rent a really good car and use it as a home base. You book that car well ahead, especially in places like the Yukon and Yellowknife, and you don't get yourself in trouble. I remember standing in line behind somebody who brought back their rental car. They had to, it was upside down in a ditch. Uh, fortunately, they had paid the full insurance, so they just said, thank you, I'm going to go and get on the plane now and go home. That was quite the adventure. 
so, so make sure you know your insurance, make sure you know the safe spots to park, especially if you're pulling off somewhere, going on an ice highway like this one in Yellowknife. You don't want to get your car stuck. You don't want to get in over your head. But if you know the terrain and you're driving on safe roads like around Iceland or main roads in Yellowknife, or even the ice roads on Yellowknife that are more often traveled in the winter or around the Yukon, you're generally going to be where people generally travel and safe. And, and you can really use that opportunity to explore on your own. If you want a turnkey sort of event, you really want to go to an Aurora Lodge or something like that, or go on a one night Aurora excursion. And, and you'll get hot chocolate. They'll even give you uh, matching North Face coats. You, you'll have great interpreters telling great stories. Uh, a lot of the best Aurora photographers also moonlight as storytellers and interpreters for these uh, outfits. But the tip here is that reputation really matters. The uh, Aurora has exploded in terms of being a tourist uh, destination and, and there's a lot of sort of fly-by-night operations. So make sure you do your research and go with the big well-known operations. Don't try and save a few bucks uh, and, and just enjoy that experience of, of being someplace where there's a nice lodge, lots of hot chocolate and lots of interpreters. Uh, Sharp focus is a huge problem with everybody all the time. It's like the universal problem of photons, as far as I know. I saw this tip here. Um, they're, they're actually using the spherochromaticism of stars in the corners of images, especially with wide angle lenses to establish whether you focus properly. Uh, what you're really doing is you, you just want to you want to zoom in with digital zoom and focus manually, and maybe even tape off your focus ring when uh, you got your focus figured out because it's terrible to come back and have all your Aurora photos a little out of focus. Don't ever rely on autofocus, of course. Uh, this answers the question about ISO levels, but uh, yeah, ISO 16 to 3200 uh, works well. And uh, as demonstrated in the left frame there, there's a lot of buttons on your camera. Know them in the dark. Make sure to turn off your, your red headlamp when you start taking exposures. I've ruined a lot of photos by not noticing my red headlamp was still on. Here's some examples of, of exposure times. On the right, you have Yellowknife with bright, fast Aurora. You're shooting at ISO 3200, one to four seconds, maybe, because everything's moving quickly and that gets you a good exposure. You want the, the slowest or the fastest shutter speed that gets you good exposure because you want all that fine structure. If they're very diffuse, you can go up to 15 to 30 seconds and catch things like the Milky Way and Andromeda, like in that Iceland photo in the middle. And if they're moving in between there, then you want to shoot in between there, five to 15 seconds, like in the image on the left. If you want your images to have maximum impact, you really have to be willing to crop them. You're shooting with a wide angle lens and wide angle lenses are notorious for catching a lot of stuff that you don't want them to or getting the perspective wrong. Like look at this Leaning Tower Pisa lighthouse that I got in Iceland. You can crop that, you can uh, fix the verticality of it. And yes, you lose a lot of your image as shown here, but you gain a lot more impact. Uh, finally, printing is really worth doing with Aurora photos. Don't just keep them on your computer. And if you're printing them, try something like a polar pearl metallic print paper. Um, these are the ones that are very sort of metallic and iridescent uh, when, when you see them. Uh, and they, they really make the colors pop. Uh, a lot of people use dye infused ink on aluminum. Those are those prints, print services uh, that provide those for you. you. Don't do those yourself. Just make sure you really follow their print profiles, especially if you're sending away. Otherwise you might be disappointed that they come back too dark or too uh, clipped on the highlights when you get them back. Uh, so yeah, like any printing, talk to your doctor or print professional before starting with that. And if you're doing video, you're really gonna be pushing your ISO up to even 50,000 and dragging your shutter down to 1 12th or 24th of a second. Alan Dyer has a great article on his setup for Sony A7s. It's possible to do and it's really worth trying to spend a part of the night capturing some of that fast motion if you really cap see some of that fast motion happening. Uh, I think we should probably wrap it up. There's more here, but we can always provide a link to uh, the rest of this presentation here. Uh, the summary here is just make sure to shoot raw. That's the big thing you take away with. Um, and make sure that, that you try things like panoramas. Try doing a 360 degree panorama and really capture the whole sky. And don't 
go and post process too much as some people do like on the right their aurora photos um, try and get something like the middle ground that's subtle and realistic and don't do something that you're trying to make everything pop and go crazy like it was psychedelic it's a really subtle phenomena it can be wildly bright too and just be honest with the phenomena and, and with what you saw and try and recreate the memory that you had when you're doing post-processing in camera raw or Photoshop or Lightroom. Uh, we'll wrap it up here, I think. Uh, Dave, does that sound good? Yep, that's great. Thank you very much, Jeremy. That's super. So um, his slides will be posted. Uh, well, this presentation will be recorded and posted on YouTube. Uh, unfortunately, our live stream didn't work tonight. YouTube reset all our account settings and uh, as a result, you have to wait 24 hours for things to come back up. So I'm sorry about that, but uh, great presentation, Jeremy. And so if you can uh, unshare your screen, I'll get Chris to share his. We're going to go to our over the break M and M challenge. You are on your dual screens. There we go. Okay. So uh, next slide then, please. Okay. So we have uh, two images here. And uh, we're going to take a five-minute bio break. So we'll be back at uh, quarter to nine and um, see if you can guess what these uh, two images are. Okay, so we'll see you in five minutes.
Okay, folks, we got about one minute to go and we'll uh, get things underway. Okay, folks, let's uh, get things uh, back up and going again. So Chris, if you can go to the next slide, please. There's the answer to our over the break quiz. So we have the uh, image on the F there, on the left there is M76, the little dumbbell nebula. And uh, the crater on the moon there is uh, Troisnecker. And uh, anyways, hopefully some of you were able to guess uh, what those were. So uh, we're going to have a, a special time right now. We call it the tips and tricks session where we've got uh, a variety of different things here that uh, people have offered to share with us. So I'm looking forward to uh, this particular uh, section. So just give me a second here. I just got to bring up all my speakers so I can make sure that I get them highlighted. So um, Haney, you're up first. So I'm going to get you to unmute yourself and I'm going to spotlight you. So your picture appears and uh, you are good to go. Just make sure you tell Chris when to advance the slide. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Haini Mraz. Uh, I just joined this year uh, and uh, I've been doing astronomy for about uh, 10 years and astrophotography for about five, five to six years. And uh, so one of the first things I learned is that uh, we have a lot of humidity. So we need a way to remove the humidity from our telescopes. Uh, otherwise, the the night is over and we can't do anything. So I looked for solutions and I didn't like any of the solutions. They were either too expensive or they didn't meet my requirements because uh, I needed something uh, since I'm running a lot off batteries. So um, I decided uh, I wanted something also to do cable management at the same time. And I wanted to use the least amount of battery power. Like I'm talking about... 50% battery power, if I can get it that low. And also the cost was very important. Uh, by the way, if anybody wants to contact me after, my email's on the bottom. You can reach me if you need any information about schematics and stuff. Uh, next slide, please. So the dew heater, it's basically uh, a wire, a, a, a neochrome wire. Uh, I decided to go with the wire because resistors, they can break. Uh, uh, with time, especially the carbon ones, and and uh, a lot of the commercial products are built with this, and uh, so you'll you'll need that special wire which you have to order, and then you need uh, some kind of a lamp wire and a connector, and uh, with a lot of testing, I found out that uh, telescopes in general that are not too large, the the resistance of the wire has to be between 14 and 16 ohm to to keep the telescope uh, warm enough to keep the dew off. And for the rest of the stuff like eyepieces, guiding ca uh, cameras, I, I use 18 ohm. Um, how I built it, it's uh, basically uh, a piece of felt, a black felt or any color, it doesn't matter. And I have um, the, the ribbon cable that you buy at a dollar store. And what I do is uh, with a sewing machine, you sew the pieces together, you make a pocket and you run the wire through. And uh, 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 there's a picture on the bottom that tells you or shows you how I did it. Uh, it's very lo low cost because everything together, you could probably do three or four dew, dew heaters for about $20. And uh, they last forever. I, I've had uh, some of them out for five or six years. I've made some for people and they last a long time. They never fail. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, part two is the controller. 
So I wanted a way to manage wires. Uh, I know there are companies out there who already have this product, but I did this like four or five years ago. Uh, I'm not sure if they had it then, but uh, basically I wanted to have one 12 volt wire going up and to the telescope. And I put this box on top and everything else gets done up on top of the telescope. So, so I don't have too many wires uh, running up and down. So uh, the first thing I did is I decided I'm going to put a, two uh, dew heater ports and they're pulse width modulated. That means that I'm not using all the power. I'm going to be using somewhere between 50, 60% of the power. And um, most of the time it's going to be drawing like 0.8 amp and half of that or 60% of that is very low power. Um, on the same box, I also have uh, 12 volt uh, distribution ports so that I can attach anything else like a camera cooler, um, if I have a USB hub, which I do have, and any other uh, optional features, like I built a, a small adapter that takes the 12 volt and gives me 7.4 volts so that I can connect my Canon uh, DSLR. So if I'm not using my astronomy camera, I can use my Canon camera. All it is is a small little module that's Velcroed to the top, and then I run one 12 volt wire to the little module. Uh, my box is six amps, so uh, it's enough current for everything. I don't run the mount off of it. I just run the um, everything that's on top of the telescope, um, and it's fuse protected. The box altogether will cost around thirty-five dollars to make it. It's not very expensive. It's uh, the parts are very easy to obtain from electronic stores. And uh, um, next slide, please. Where do you order the nichrome wire? Is it uh, on or eBay. Not? eBay? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I also have a second controller. This is the one I use in winter. The first one was for summer where um, I, I have a lot of equipment, like I'm running um, the camera cooler. I'm running the uh, a bunch of things. So here in winter, I do a, things a little bit different. I'm only running a Canon camera. And I'm running a little tracking mount with the basically the ioptron one. So I don't need, uh, and I only have one dew heater. So this version, which is relatively new, I just made it last year. Uh, I only have uh, two 12 volt, uh, 12 volt output ports and one 7.4 volt output from my Canon camera. By the way, the, the voltage is adjustable in case I have other models of cameras. Uh, Inside the unit, there is an adjustment on the uh, regulator. I can set it to eight volt. I can set it all the way up to about 10 volt if I have a different type of camera. Uh, I also have uh, that one dew heater port, which is not pulsed yet, but might be in the future. And this uh, dew heater, you can make it, but I decided to buy it because it was just so, so cheap on eBay. I think I ended up paying $11 for it. So I decide since I only need one, I'll buy it. But basically, it runs off a five volt USB port. Again, this I have the same specs on the box. It's six amps and it's fuse protected, and the price is about the same. And uh, next slide, please. So here are the photos, and the one on the left shows you my eighty millimeter refractor. With, with all the boxes mounted. I did have to put in a small aluminum plate, but um, I have all the wires running on top. It, it, it doesn't really look nice because I don't have it on a mount, but you can see that every single wire is on top of the telescope and it eliminates anything going wrong, me accidentally disconnecting something. The winter setup is on the right. And here I just have a, a tripod with the sky tracker, the old Ioptron one. And I have the same box, and I, I I don't I don't think you see the camera very well, but the camera is there, and all the wires are are going up. There's only one wire going up, uh, actually two: the USB wire, and same with the other one. A USB wire you need, and you need the power wire. So it eliminates me tripping over any wires, and uh, makes my life easy in winter. And whenever I want to just leave, I just detach my the two wires. I take my equipment, put it in the car and I go home with the whole thing attached. Uh, I guess that's it for me.
sorry, I was muted there. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Haney. That's that's super. Uh, now, do you have the schematics and stuff for your stuff? Uh, yes, uh, I so can. So they can just email you, and you'll send it to them. Yeah. Do I send it to individuals or to you? Well, you send it to anybody who was interested in the schematics. Okay. Uh, you can. Uh, they can email you. It was, it's in your presentation, and uh, that would be great. Okay, thank you. Thank you very so, much. So next up is uh, Ken. And just a second, Ken, I'm going to highlight you. There you go. And you're unmuted from the looks of it. Okay. I'm off. Thanks, thanks Dave. I, so I'm Ken Smith. I've member of the RSC for a number of years, so I'm a particularly active member. I've been doing astronomy since probably 1965 with many types of telescopes. Most recently, I've gotten really strictly into electronically assisted astronomy. There was actually a talk a couple of meetings ago where basically I have a telescope set up, uh, camera, uh, software, go to a telescope, and I operate my telescope from, in, from inside the house. So um, I'm an electronics engineer by profession, and I like making gadgets for astronomy and other things. I'm going to go fairly quickly over four of my gadgets I've made and uh, see the title here. My contact is down there if people are curious, more curious about these things. So um, Chris, the next uh, slide, please. Um, I have a 50 millimeter Orion guide scope uh, to guide and also I use as an imager. I wound up having a lot of problems with the USB video cable. I don't know what was wrong. I thought it kept crashing. Turns out the cable was wiggling the connector and it just, uh, so I added this white colored PVC uh, short pipe on the end. Uh, I happen to have a, a lathe, I machined the inside diameter to fit over the camera at the back end of this uh, uh, scope. And you can, this is attached to my Celestron uh, 9.25 uh, go to telescope. And you see the rear view, you see the auto guide connector, then you see the USB connector. And I have four threaded set screws. And on the right, lower right, you will see the screws clamped down to the rectangular black plastic uh, cable body. Uh, that actually stopped the video from interrupting, and that uh, works quite well. I can slow the scope all over the sky. Uh, in the wintertime, cables get very stiff and works uh, quite well. It took me a long time to figure this one out. I thought just usual USB video crashing, but no, it was a connector wiggling around. And <clears throat> so it uh, seems to work quite well. You also notice my homemade uh, anti-dew heater and anti-dew shield on the left, uh, the front end of the 50 millimeter guide scope. I'll get to uh, any two here's in a minute. Um, okay, Chris, can you have the next slide? So, yeah, so now, um, now Haney talked about uh, efficient battery operated anti two heaters. I tend to work uh, outside my home. You can see my house behind my Celestron. 9.25 uh, black Smith Castrain telescope. So I have all the power I want, AC 120 volts. So I said, okay, I, yeah, I could buy an anti do here from uh, Kendrick, but can I make one? Well, um, you see my old 1980 orange eight inch Smith Castrain. I put the bench, the base on the bench, point it to the zenith. And you see in the zoom shot, some number 30 gauge uh, magnet wire. That's that round colored wire you see on motors and transformers, et cetera. And I wind uh, probably about um, 70 or so turns. I have a spreadsheet that calculates the resistance I need. And I just turn the scope on its base very carefully by hand. Use massing tape to hold things. Don't let go of the wire while you're turning it. Keep it in close contact with the metal so it'll conduct the heat from the wire. And I use a, a 20 volt lapse uh, power supply from an old laptop. I'll get into that in a minute. Um, Kendrick recommend 25 watts for a nine and a quarter inch, 20 watts for an eight inch. So you can calculate the number of turns you need for the resistance. You give it uh, 18 or 20 volts, and lo and behold, you've got 
both direct power dissipation. You then put on an anti-dew shield over the top of it. You see in the lower right, my bigger celestron. And so that, of course, you, uh, that keeps the dew away, but you always need electrical power when the nights get quite humid. And so it worked quite well for a number of years. I wound a number of these things this way. Um, it, of course, it, I will also wrap tape, some transparent plastic tape rounds to protect the wires before I uh, put, put on the dew shield. And so I've had uh, quite good luck with this. So uh, Chris, if you go to the next slide, please. Power, these things need power. Um, one of the issues about dew here is that wires eventually always break, uh, especially at night, it's very cold. The telescope's going all over the sky. And I've had times when the heater just quit. What, what happened? Well, I made a little schematic here. I won't get into any great detail, but I put an LED basically in series with the uh, 120 volt AC line. So if the dew heater fails, a wire breaks, you immediately know that the LED LED uh, goes out. The LED's quite dim, so it's not a problem in dark in darkness. And so when you plug it in at uh, dust setting the thing up, you know that it's working right away. You don't have to worry about uh, you've got a broken wire and your anti-do heater. Well, I like to scrounge things. Uh, I make things of the stuff I have. So I will pull power modules from the e-waste bin, if I don't have them already, from a dead laptop. And um, some safety notes in red. Uh, try to use a GFCI outlet, the outdoor outlet power the scope, ground the scope and tripod, use a polarized plug and then seal and tape the parts uh, for the wetter so you don't get any possible electric shock. If you aren't used to doing electrical wiring, I perhaps wouldn't attempt this, but uh, this is my kind of semi-crude approach, isn't it? Uh, again, it works uh, quite well. And uh, then yeah, I just, I won't describe the schematic too much, but uh, just some resistors and a diode in series with the AC power. So there's no D effect on the DC power going to the heaters. And I use a five volt uh, module for the uh, a four watt anti do here on, on the 50 millimeter guide scope. And scrounge from uh, some something that was thrown away. And Chris, the last slide is next. Um, remote focuser, I operate it inside. Just you see the window there in my house. I have cables going through the window, and uh, so I can do remote focusing. Uh, I'd rather build things and buy things, like I sell a stepper motor from some printer or fax machine many years ago. I then built a electronic RS-232 to motor drive stepper controller. The ribbon, flat ribbon cable goes through the window, and then I attach the motor uh, with a gear reduction assembly to the back end of a Schmidt Cassegrain with we all know the focus knobs are at the back and it's a quite a simple interface. I use a uh, very crude yellow capped on tape to seal it from the environment because a, um, a box of some sort would add weight. You don't want really much more weight on the back end of a fork mount Smith Cassegrain, especially when you have a heavy camera as well at, your, at the back end of the optics. And I use, um, software to uh, step the motor from running from my laptop. So everything is salvaged. Uh, I really did not much cost. I wouldn't even know how much it would cost to build it. Um, so that uh, works, uh, that works quite like a focus uh, back and forth as the focus drifts during night or whatever. So that's the end of my gadgets, uh, Chris. Okay. Thank you, Ken. So we're going to turn it over to uh, JS here. Let me just spotlight you. There you go. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Dave. Um, so um, I am going to present a uh, DIY of Batnov mask. Um, so I've recently, I've been observing for a long time, been to astronomy for a long time. Uh, just recently kind of started playing around with uh, cameras and, uh, and all that, and uh, as well as uh, electronic pieces of astronomy. Um, and one of the first things I realized is um, a lot of my images were, were out of focus, even though I thought I kind of had eyeballed it. Uh, they were kind of out of focus. And I was thinking, well, how there, I mean, there must be a way to, you know, how do you get images to be perfectly in focus as you see in the, 
you know, uh, all those nice pictures we see from other members or online. Uh, so, um, and the answer is, uh, if you go to that next slide, it's uh, it's called, I researched it, it's called the Batnov mask. Um, so, so what it is, is it's, it's a pretty simple tool. It's, it's, it's a mask. So it's something you put uh, on your telescope when you're setting it, setting it up for photography. So it's a, it's a tool to achieve the best focus possible for astrophotography. It really helps you to get a, your focus bang on. Uh, the principle of operation is it's using basically three diffraction grids uh, producing spikes. And uh, by uh, changing the focus, you're, you're making small deviations in the you know, sort of uh, what looks kind of like an interference uh, pattern and eventually you align, uh, I'll show that later, you align the spikes until it's very much uh, at the best focus you can possibly achieve with your with your equipment. Uh, so if we go to the next. Uh, so how do you make one? It's actually very simple. Um, you can buy one pre-made. Um, I just thought uh, it'd be kind of a fun project. Uh, it's really, you know, it's not it's not hard to make at all. Um, you'll need to use a template. Um, so the one I use is from, from Master of Jargon. Uh, you basically enter your, your the focal length of the telescope, your aperture. Uh, you want to size it for your, for your for the, the telescope you'll be using it with. And uh, the edge thickness is just uh, how much further um, uh, you want it to extend. You kind of want it to, to be secure on the telescope as you're, as you're, as you're using it. Uh, so next slide. Um, so basically, the the, uh, the template will look like this on the on the left here. So it's it's just a this one prints out an SVG file. So it's a file you can use in um, uh, like a vector graphics. You can print it to, to to size and all that. So what I did is I just really I just printed it out to uh, you know to one to one scale. Um, I I used a cardboard box. I mean uh, it really didn't cost much. It's it's duct tape and cardboard. Uh, the most expensive part was probably the uh, the trip to Costco to get the box because uh, nobody goes to Costco and ends up out there with only you know twenty dollars worth of stuff. Um, so so then I basically used a template on the cardboard box, uh, cut it out, and this is the the end result there. Um, and then when it's completed, um, this is it in action on the right on my uh, on my daub. So it just goes in front of the telescope, and then it's uh, it's ready for action. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, and uh, so this is basically how it looks like when you're using it. Um, you start, you pick a bright star, and you want to pick a bright star because it, it actually the mass does stop down the your, your telescope quite a bit. So um, it'll be you know, the stars will be dimmer than, than what they appear uh, in your in your camera without the mask. Uh, so if when it's really grossly out of focus, you'll see basically. A what looks like the mask uh, in your in your uh, image uh, as you're focusing you're getting closer to the to, to your to a good focus you can see that there's there's spikes that are formed and then as you're slightly off uh, i mean they get closer to the center to to really a star pattern um and if you can see if you look between the the bingo picture where it is you know this is really the best focus i, th I think i could achieve at that point and it's slightly off, you'll see that it's the lines are really just a bit off center. So this is really what you want to play with uh, as you're focusing uh, to, to get it to the center. And uh, the last image on the bottom left is is uh, when I take the mask off. It's a lot a lot brighter, but you can see that's that's as good as I'll get for for a focus. Um, the stars are a bit trailed there because I wasn't tracking. But um, anyways, it's a really I found is a really neat project. It, it, it took the longest time. I mean, it took me. One or two hours just to really cut the the uh, the slits and the mask, and that's probably the the most work it, it took me. But but really, I you know it took maybe uh, yeah, an evening, and I, I got a really good uh, tool that I use uh, you know every observing session out of it. So so yeah, that's my uh, my DIY that not mask. Hey, thanks, Jess. That's that's super. Okay. Okay, so uh, I just want to show you the uh, $25 crutches tripod that you could build for your telescope. When I purchased my telescope used from the federal government, it did not come with a tripod. It was a uh, Celestron Nexstar 5. And I tried putting it on a, a picnic table and it didn't work very well and I was looking directly above. And so I said, okay, I need a tripod. I actually found this idea online. I can't remember who the person was. Uh, I sort of modified it a little bit and put it all together. 
And uh, I have sent all the details of what I'm presenting tonight to uh, Gordon Webster, and he can he may put it in astronauts with all the all the stuff. Okay, so let's just go to the uh, next screen. So it's relatively inexpensive crutches. Best place to get them, Value Village or the thrift store. Or around six dollars a crutch. They may be up a little bit more now, but uh, in any case, you the, the key thing here is you want to make sure they're exactly the same make and model, so that you've got even legs, and that's the biggest challenge. I think at one point I had uh, probably eight uh, eight crutches, and eventually I was able to find three that I could work with, and then uh, the ones that you don't use, you just take back, donate them back to the Valley Village or thrift store, and uh, you search out for some more. You can need some two by threes or two by fours by about 24 inches. You're basically gonna cut them into six sections. You're gonna need a three foot by two foot sheet of plywood, about a half inch thick. You're gonna need some deck screws, one and a quarter and two and a half, and uh, six washers. Next uh, screen. The other thing you're gonna need in terms of equipment, I don't have it on the slide here, but you are gonna need an electric drill uh, with a quarter inch bit, an eight inch bit, a jigsaw to cut out the circle, a circular saw to cut out the triangle, a router or table saw to groove out uh, the blocks, a C-clamp and a level. So basically uh, you remove and discard the crutch pad. That's the piece that fits under your, uh, under your armpit. And you basically drill out the rivets with a quarter inch uh, drill bit and drill all the way through. So you've got a hole all the way through the uh, top there. Uh, you remove and discard the hand grip, but save the long bolt uh, piece and the wing nut. Then you're gonna cut out uh, a triangle, an equilateral triangle, 20 by 20 by 20 from plywood. Cut out a 10 inch circle from plywood. It doesn't have to be exactly 10 inches. That happened to be the size of the pot lid that I found under our stove that worked well for my uh, particular project. Next. So these, uh, so three of these, this is what the, um, the hand grip rod is gonna sit into. So you basically just need to ride out about a third of the way in and about half inch deep, a groove uh, on uh, three of the two by four by four inch blocks. Next slide. Then you're gonna mount the non routed blocks on the 10 inch circle equally spaced. And uh, then you mount the crutches onto those uh, through the crutch pad holes to the non route through those blocks using a washer and uh, two and a half inch uh, wood screws. Next slide. Then the, the next step is uh, you're gonna take your triangle. Now in this case here, I, I've sawed off the tips of the triangle after I put it together, but uh, initially they're extending over the end of the block there. You're gonna set it up on a level surface and then place the triangle piece and the routed blocks on the hand grip bolts and you're gonna tighten those wing nuts. So you see the one of the wing nuts over here. So the blocks aren't moving. And um, then uh, on to the next slide. So then what you're gonna do is you're going to adjust the tripod until you're level on the top and the circular piece on the top. And once you're level, then you're gonna take a C-clamp and clamp the three uh, pieces here. And then you're just gonna screw them in. And the other key thing you need to do is so that it becomes level every time you take it out is that you number the block here and you number the top of the, uh, the crutch here. So you always put it back together in the same way. And then uh, the last step is to cut off the, uh, the corner of the, of the uh, triangle there. Next slide. This is the uh, sort of a diagram of the different pieces that you need here. This is the uh, finished product with my uh, telescope uh, sitting on top. It's very, very strong. I could probably sit on it myself and it would hold my weight, not that I've tried that. Uh, but it gives me the clearance that I need if I'm looking at, at something directly up in the sky. And as I said, for 25 bucks, it's uh, relatively inexpensive. Okay, so that's my uh, project. Okay, we've got Bob Olson up next. Just let me highlight you here. How do you do? Okay, you're uh, there. The, uh, well, this is a picture of uh, my telescope and I. Uh, next slide, Chris. Um, there's, Everybody wants a bigger telescope, and the problem with a bigger telescope is, is a property of telescopes called lugability. And if a telescope gets too hard to lug, it won't get used. And uh, my telescope is definitely getting approaching that. It's a very heavy scope. Uh, next slide, Chris. The uh, 77 pounds of counterweight should be kind of a clue. 
it takes two of us to get the telescope up onto the mount, and it probably takes me two days to run all the wires to make it work. There's not a chance that I'm going to use this thing very much if I have to set it up and take it down after a negative observer. So what's the solution to using it more often? Uh, next slide, please. Obviously, an observatory. Uh, it jumps into your mind immediately, and this is a really nice one here, which, which we all like to own. Um, but that's not going to happen. Let's say this is pretty big. But we need a place to put our, obser our, our observatory also. So next slide. Uh, this is Jimmy's garden. And uh, it looks to me to be a perfect place to put a, a, a dome for an observatory. Uh, next slide. As you can see, it fits perfectly, and next slide. My telescope, by some miracle, fits inside of it perfectly also. Anyway, when I suggested this to Jimmy, uh, she did not receive it with the, with, the, with the joy that I thought she would. And uh, so we had our typical handled family disputes by making a vote, and I lost one to infinity. So uh, next slide, please. So what to do? How do I get my telescope out? I need to just tell you a little tiny bit about my observing situation here. This is my shop slash observatory. And uh, next slide, Chris. Uh, this concrete platform at the back of my shop uh, doubles as my, my observing platform. And um, my view is south and east. And if you head straight out of the back of my shop, you run into the uh, St. Lawrence River, it's about 20 kilometers south of me. And there's nothing much between me and the St. Lawrence except uh, forest and fields. And then you cross the St. Lawrence and you run into northern New York. And uh, it's mostly uninhabited. So I have a great view if I can use it. So what's, you know, how can I get that heavy telescope outside the door? Next slide. Chris, can you run that for me? I apologize for the jiggles. Uh, so here I am, and my telescope is on wheels. So I can pull it out. And having it on wheels is not enough, because you need to make it put it in the same spot every time. So you don't have to do polar line. It's, there's pins on the legs of my tripod and I'm going to lower my tripod onto the pin into the hole. I can then rotate it around and there's a pin on this one too and I will lower it out with an electric motor into that hole. And the last leg doesn't need a pin because you know two pins locate the telescope. I take off the dew cover uh, this is an Ethernet cable which connects all the electronics on my telescope for imaging to my imaging computer. Uh, it, it still won't run though because all my equipment needs power. So I run out an extension cord, plug it in, head back into the shop, close the door to keep the lights and the heat from the inside the, inside the observatory from disturbing my viewing. And I'm ready to roll. That took one and a half minutes, if you were timing it. Next slide. How did I do this? What, what's sort of the procedure behind it? Well, uh, this is the leg of my tripod. You can see that it's a two by four, uh, a steel beam, and uh, there's a bolt that which acts like a pin, goes into that hole in the concrete. And the first iteration of this was the wheels that people use to move around machinery in a shop. And you can buy these at any shop store. Uh, I got these ones, I can believe it or not, at um, uh, Simpson Sears, but they're available at Princess Auto, Busy Bee, probably anybody who sells big shop tools will sell these wheels. And uh, they're foot controlled. You, that lever, 
you can move it with your foot. Uh, you don't want to use your hands because it snaps around pretty good when you lower the machine. Okay, next slide. This is another view of the locating pin and the index hole in the concrete. The co by the way, I uh, epoxied in a, a steel pipe, which explains the rust uh, into the concrete. Okay, next slide. And this is it being operated by, the, by my foot to uh, make it go up and down. The problem with this is when it goes down, it goes down with a pretty good clunk. So in the dark, um, it's hard to hit the hole in the concrete with the pin. And it goes down pretty hard. Uh, so it jolts everything pretty good. And the next problem is it won't support my telescope. Uh, when I upgraded my telescope to the big one, this was no longer satisfactory. The wheels, the metal in the wheels, the, the bracket actually bent. Uh, the cam on the lever started to wear away badly, so I needed to I needed to do uh, some upgrades to do it to to uh, make it more suitable for me. And if you notice the beam just under my foot, it's a single beam. Next slide, please. Well, here's what I, the changes that I made. Uh, I, first of all, I welded a, another chunk of beam over uh, another chunk of leg over the top to give me a bigger, flatter surface. And uh, I went to Princess Auto and I bought a 12 volt, I actually bought three 12 volt uh, DC motors and these are used to adjust your car seat. That is, they move your seat forward and backward. They're surplus 10 bucks each. Uh, they come with an acne threaded shaft, uh, which the motor turns slowly. Uh, clearly, you don't want your seat flying ahead at light speed when you're adjusting it. Um, the shaft is anchored to the top through a bracket, and when the shaft turns, it moves a nut further away or higher. And when it moves further away, it pushes the wheel down. And when the wheel goes down, it lifts my telescope. Okay, next slide. This is a side view of it, and you can see the two parallel arms uh, that keep the wheel vertical. If the wheel is not vertical, and you have much weight on it on a caster wheel, it wants to only go one direction. And so then it's hard to push your scope out without having it crash into a wall. And I show you the pivot point for the shaft up at the very top also. Now, uh, next slide. This is the up and down switch. To make the thing go up and down, you need to basically reverse the wires. And to reverse the wires, uh, use a double pull, double throw switch, and uh, it's uh, the, the straight out is doing nothing. Up is up and down is down. Okay, next slide. You can see that I'm using the same indexing pins that I used for the foot operated one, and uh, dropped into the concrete floor again. Uh, I am now able to move it up and down slowly, so I have some kind of control over this thing going up and down. You'll notice the wires leading for the motor, and that's where the power comes from. And what, what would you use for the, to supply the power? My first thought was to use a transformer or a power supply, but then I have to plug my telescope in to move it. I can tell you from past experience, if you try and move the telescope with the plugged in, you run over the cord. It's just that uh, you've got three wheels, you try to keep track of them all, the cord is always in the road. Need a different method. Okay, next slide. So I use a 18 volt drill battery. Um, I have all kinds of power tools with, with this particular battery in it. So I just grabbed one and I, the first iteration, I clipped the power leads to the battery and uh, it, uh, that worked fine. And then a friend of mine who's in the trades and has, he, he uses these things, he's, he uh, uses these things like throwaway Tim Hortons cups and he had all kinds of battery chargers. And so he just gave me a battery charger and I just rewired it to be a, a basically a socket for the battery. Okay, next slide. And you can see the battery just slips in and out of that easily. It's always lined up just right. Uh, when my battery runs down, I switch it out for another battery, which I have several of, or you stick it in a charger. Uh, it works really well. Now, the this is a concept. This is not in a, a set of instructions on how to make one of these things. Uh, but 
I've talked to uh, our astronauts editor, and uh, I want to send him some pictures, and I will show uh, some school photographs, and I'll put some dimensions on the pictures. Uh, so if you want to, to uh, use this idea, feel free. Uh, if you have any questions about it, feel free to ask me. But I image on every clear night. Uh, I can roll my stuff out. It's so easy. I think this is easier than opening a dome. I really do. Uh, I don't think you can get a dome open and everything running in a minute and a half. It just isn't going to happen. Okay, last slide. Now, here's the here's the thing about getting out under the sky, nice guys, more often. If you don't have uh, a significant other that is willing to tolerate your hobby and all its bizarre hours and uh, weird uh, junk, uh, you're not going to get out very much at all. And I really lucked out with Jimmy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. That's, that's super. And uh, we we'll look forward to the more details in, in the upcoming astronauts. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Richard Taylor now. Okay, so uh, after that mechanical masterpiece, we're back to the uh, tin cans and tape uh, version. So uh, I've been doing some astrophotography for quite a while and even got a new telescope recently, but um, I've always been a little bit jealous of all the astrophotos taken with Newtonian telescopes. And uh, I was wondering if I could get the same effect with uh, the refractor. And I found out, well, yes, you can. Next slide. Oops, back there. <laughs> so here we go, just the tin can and masking tape version. <clears throat> so I had, uh, took the both ends off the tin can and uh, softened the ends so it wouldn't scratch the uh, front of my telescope by wrapping uh, some electrical tape around the edges. And then, uh, put some fishing line across. Oh, I forgot to put that in the uh, list of ingredients. So this fishing line across the front in a X-shaped pattern. Um, I understand that you can also make a, a three-pointed star and uh, make uh, six-pointed stars on your images. But I just tried this uh, two lines in each direction of uh, fishing line, held in place with masking tape, and then uh, made more permanent by putting some hot glue on it. And the result is next picture. There we go. There's M13 and the bright stars nearby all have these lovely uh, diffraction spikes around them. It only works on the very brightest of the stars, but I think it really makes a nice effect. I'm really looking forward to trying this again on the Pleiades. So that was one of my little ideas. Next one, please. The other thing I've been learning recently is a little bit more about uh, post-processing my pictures and uh, the need for a nice flat field. So once again, something to stick on the front of your telescope. I didn't have another tin can in my recycling bin at the time, but a yogurt tub worked just as well, again, with the bottom cut out. And I found that um, a photo display sheet that I had in a, an old um, photo album had this lovely translucent white backing. So I cut a circular piece out of there just a bit bigger than the end of the yogurt tub, <clears throat> hot glued it to the end of the tub, and uh, made this nice translucent white, very flat um, kind of filter for the front of the telescope. Next picture. This is how I use it. Um, with the filter on the end, I can just hold up my iPad on the end, showing a plain blank white picture. And even though it may be a bit pixelated, the uh, translucent uh, filter on the end of the telescope <clears throat> smooths that out very nicely. And so the result of the image is what you see down below, just a plain gray um, flat field that will 
come will will allow you to subtract any of the distortions of your actual imaging system the telescope all the way through to the camera and i found that that worked quite nicely i use the self timer on the camera take 10 quick shots using aperture priority mode and use those to make the flat field average so that's it Okay, we're going to move into uh, observation reports, and uh, we have uh, Jim Sophia is the first one up. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me well? Yes. Fantastic. All right. So uh, all my images that I'm displaying were taken off my balcony a short time ago with the Mallenkamp Sky Raider uh, 10S. Uh, 10C, and I also used the William Optics uh, 81 millimeter refractor. I used an Optolong L Enhanced filter, and I processed the images with Topaz Studio. So the first image I like to show you is IC1396, uh, which is the Elephant Trunk Nebula, and this is a dense region of dust and gas found within a considerably larger star formation region in the constellation Cepheus. Uh, the Elephant Trunk Nebula is 2,400 light years away, and this is a stack of 18 23 second exposures. Next slide, please. Uh, the next one is the first one for me. It's uh, IC uh, 17. No, I think we you want to back up a bit. Uh, I think you skipped one. There you go. Uh, so this is uh, 1795, and it's the Fish Head Nebula, which is an H2 region of glowing gas and dust in a star-forming area in Cassiopeia. It's part of the Hart Nebula, <clears throat> located about 7,000 light years away. And this is a stack of 20 18-second exposures. Next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, this is the Hart Nebula. I see 1805. Oh, I think we've skipped one over again. Want to go back to the Hart Nebula? There you go. And the Hart Nebula is an emission nebula showing glowing ionized hydrogen gas and darker dust lanes. The fish head, which you saw just a little while ago, is located on the bottom limb of this image, which is not visible now. This is a stack of 20, 25 second exposures. Next slide, please. Thank you. So this is the Sol Nebula, IC1848, which is located around the same region as the Hart Nebula in Cassiopeia. And this is a stack of 20, 20 second exposures. Next slide, please. And now we're looking at uh, the Pelican Nebula, IC5070, which is on the left, where you see the pelican's beak and head pointed upward. And on the right is a portion of the North America Nebula, which is in the constellation Cygnus. And this is a stack of 20 17-second exposures. Next slide, please. And this is the North America Nebula, NGC 7000, a stack of 12 17 second exposures. Next slide, please. And this is the last image, NGC 7380, the Wizard Nebula, which is an emission nebula in the constellation Cepheus, discovered by Caroline Herschel, sister of, uh, sister of William Herschel, and this was discovered in 1787. The Wizard Nebula is located approximately 7,200 light years away. And the Wizard Nebula is an interplay of stars, gas, and dust that has created a shape that appears to some like a fictional medieval sorcerer. This active star forming region spans about 100 light years. And this is a stack of 16, 24 second exposures. Thank you very much. 
Thanks, Jim. So uh, Richard uh, Taylor is up next. Okay. So uh, first of all, I'd just like to apologize to everybody uh, for that string of cloudy nights just after the last full moon. Um, you see, I, I bought a new telescope. So uh, <laughs> by the end of June, the sky has managed to clear up a bit and I uh, had some lovely sessions at my brother's place near Athens, Ontario. And uh, so here's a picture of my new telescope using my old camera so I could get the Milky Way as the background for it. Lovely dark skies in that area near Temperance Lake. So the new telescope is a William Optic Zenith Star Z73. And I also have a new Canon M100 mirrorless camera on it. Unfortunately, the uh, field flattener hasn't arrived yet. So you may notice in some of the pictures that uh, the stars at the corners of the frame are a little bit uh, smeary. I'm still using my old star adventurer um, star tracker. So next please. So what better to try it out uh, than on the June challenge objects. So this was uh, M64, the Black Eye Galaxy. And uh, I'd also like to say a big thank you to Paul Clowninger for the uh, local uh, seminars on image processing and also to Paul Bowen from the New Brunswick RASC for his uh, uh, seminars also on Zoom from the national office. So I've learned a lot recently about image processing. I've been stacking my pictures and stretching them and uh, doing all kinds of wonderful things. It's just terrific. Okay, next one. Now this one's a little bit harder to find, uh, but this was the second uh, intermediate challenge object, NGC 5529. You can just make it out in the uh, lower right hand corner of this picture, a very thin edge on uh, spiral galaxy. But I did catch it. <laughs> However, given how small and dim that one was, I didn't decided not to try the advanced challenge. So next one, please. I did do the lunar challenge, however. So here is the uh, crater Katharina. And for this one, using the new telescope, I had to use an eyepiece and a barlow to zoom right in on this uh, collection of three craters. Next picture. I've labeled them, whoops, back again. Can we go back one? There. So it's the lower of the three large craters that's Katharina. Uh, there's also Cyrillus and Theophilus all surrounding the edge of Mare Nectaris. Next one, please. So still trying out the new telescope, I decided to do a few uh, of the big showpieces. Here's the big dumbbell nebula, M27. Next one, please. And M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy up in Ursa Major. I was very pleased at uh, how well this came, on, this came out. And so I tried for the uh, M101 pinwheel. Next one. Next one, yeah. And this really blew, my, blew me away. <laughs> I've been trying to take pictures or even see this with my eyes for a long time. And uh, this is the first time I've really had a, a success with it. And furthermore, if you look at the next picture, there's several other galaxies nearby. So I'm really happy with this uh, new telescope. I'm very happy with the, the image processing that I've been able to do afterwards. Next one, please. Also in Ursa Major, here is uh, M97 and uh, M108, also known as the Owl and the Surfboard. The Owl is another uh, planetary nebula, and the Surfboard is another uh, edge-on spiral galaxy with lots of dust lanes. 
However, I'm still learning my setup. So if you look at the next picture, that's what happened when I tried to take a whole series of pictures of the owl and the surfboard. I wasn't watching carefully my counterweight. And uh, after about six pictures, I think it was, the rest of the sequence of pictures were all trailed like this. And when I checked around to see what had gone wrong, I found that my counterweight had struck the head of the tripod and had pushed the polar alignment way off and everything was going to pop. Anyway, got to check on that every time now. But I did manage to fix it, set it up and do another sequence. So next one, please. I finally uh, aimed at Cygnus well away from the north so that my counterweight was uh, off the tripod again. And uh, this is a picture of the um, Western Veil Nebula, also known as NGC 6960, or the Witch's Broom Nebula. It's just on the uh, wingtip of Cygnus the Swan. So thank you, that's it for me. Okay, thank you, Richard. So next up is uh, Bob. How do you do? Um, this is uh, my view of the uh, challenge object, uh, M64, the Black Eyed Galaxy. If you look at it in a telescope, you really it it does look a little bit like a black eye too. Uh, it's uh, high in the sky right now, and uh, easy magnitude to uh, nine object. You should, if you have a chance, go take a look at it. Okay, next slide, please, Chris. Uh, this is the next challenge object, uh, 5529, and uh, it's uh, basically a skinny uh, edge-on galaxy. Uh, it's about 20 degrees above M64, which is sort of in the area of Arcturus, if you're trying to find it in the sky. Uh, it's magnitude 13, so I think that would be a challenge without a pretty decent scope. Anyway, the next one. I love this next one. It was, uh, it's just above the teapot in Sagittarius, so it's pretty low in the sky, and uh, it's magnitude 13, so it's pretty dim, and it's eight arc seconds in size. So I thought to myself, eight arc seconds is pretty small, uh, but you know, my stars are typically uh, uh, three or four arc seconds, so I should be able to pick out a, um, a planetary nebula from my stars. Except when you start getting down near the horizon, my stars get to be about eight seconds across. And as you can see, in the, when you're pointed right at the heart of the Milky Way, there are some other stars in the picture. So what, what is the planetary nebula in here? And so if you picked out that red thing in the very middle of the picture, which is what I thought myself, you'd be wrong. Next slide. It's actually that one right there. And if I look really, really closely at it, uh, you know, blow it all up, I can see that it's not actually starlight. So that's what it is. I can't even imagine how you'd find this naked eye in this star field. Maybe an O3 filter blinking out the star. That when you put an O3 filter across the view, uh, stars get dimmer and the planetary nebula may not. Uh, good luck. Anyway, I, I, this, these are the challenges. I just, I just want to have a shout out to Oscar here. I really enjoy these things, Oscar, so keep it up. Get them a little higher in the sky, if you don't mind. <laughs> okay, while we were in Sagittarius, next slide, I started, uh, was there, so I started looking at other things. I don't image this low in the sky very often, but this is M6, the butterfly cluster. Pretty. Uh, you can see that it's not incredibly sharp because it's low in the sky, basically just above the tree line, uh, but still interesting. Next one, please. This is one which, which almost all of us who have telescopes and pointed them in the Sagittarius area have seen, M17, the Omega Nebula. Uh, gorgeous. Uh, shows up quite nicely with even a pair of binoculars. Next one. Uh, this is M21. It's uh, another uh, Cluster in Sagittarius. Next one, please. M25, another open cluster in 
uh, Sagittarius. Uh, Attila Danko calls these things boring open clusters, but uh, you know they're still all a little bit different. Uh, also, they're in uh, sort of aimed toward the center of the galaxy, and the pictures all have a kind of a brownish cast to them. Uh, I guess that's the dust we're looking through. Uh, next one. Yeah, this is the flickering glob uh, globulars M62 again in Sagittarius. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I've seen this with binoculars. Okay, and after I'd finished fooling around in Sagittarius, I mean, because Sagittarius sets early, I, I still had the rest of the evening, so I just pointed my scope up uh, into uh, the night sky. And uh, next picture. This is high in the sky. Uh, this is the eastern veil. As you saw, you saw the you saw the western veil a minute ago, and uh, uh, I have imaged this before, but but every time I've imaged it, I've imaged it in uh, hydrogen alpha to get the red and oxygen three to get the blue. Uh, this is the first time I've ever imaged it imaged it in uh, red, green, and blue filters, which is what I was using earlier in the evening. And it's a pretty spectacular sight in the in an image, and it's actually pretty neat to look at visually with a telescope too. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Bob. So next up is Taras. I uh, can't hear you, Taras. Is your mic off? You you appear to be unmuted. No, nothing yet. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now, yeah. Okay, cool. So uh, this would extend a little bit Jeremy's presentation about the uh, auroras. This is a sunspot which causes it eventually. And uh, they were not too often lately because as Jeremy mentioned, the sun was at our minimum. We have this 11 years uh, uh, cycles, solar cycles, when uh, the solar activity changes from the peak to the minimum, and last year was the minimum. Last time we, we saw a, a, a sunspot of this size was about May last year, and since then there are practically none. So uh, what are they? Um, the regions of reduced surface temperature caused by concentration of magnetic field flux that inhibits uh, convention. Uh, the number of varies depending on the cycle. So this is the first one since the, uh, since the cycle was at its lowest and let's hope it's gonna be more and more often happening now on, leading eventually to the, to the eruption and to the solar winds and to the uh, auroras. Uh, this one was designated, or I took this actually on June 7th and uh, it had the designation AR2765. Um, this was, this was said to be a type B psych, uh, spot, which was, was, de was destined for an eruption. And according to spaceweather.com, uh, this class B type of spots uh, causes flares. Uh, they're relatively small, but uh, the, their eruptions are equal in energy to about 100 million atomic bombs explosions. So that, that, well, in terms of science, nothing in terms of earth that the spot itself is the size of the of the earth if you can go to the next slide please so this is the close-up of them and uh, the uh, another interesting feature is that uh, a couple of days after i took this picture uh, that uh, sunspot developed a tail and uh, again spaceweather.com says that the tail of ar 2765 stretches almost 70,000 kilometers from end to end. Uh, it's, and it's not entirely stable. The images from multiple astronomers show that it, it show its changing shape and direction. So if the tail twists enough to reconnect with itself, then bang, the explosion, uh, the, the explosion could occur. Uh, even if it did, which apparently it did, but uh, it was not on our way, it didn't reach uh, our Earth on its path so we didn't see the auroras. Let's go to the next slide, please. Um, I did some uh, more imaging of planets. So 
the good news is that the tiny Mars is uh, approaching um, in terms of the distance between us and Mars is the, the distance is getting uh, smaller and smaller. So this was taken June 18th when the planet was size of 10 arc seconds. But the good news is that on October 6th uh, this year, it's going to be 22.6 arc second big. So this is great opportunity to take uh, a look at that planet from kind of close and um, uh, I'm sure it will reveal more details. Even now you can see the polar cap and some details on the surface. Let's go to the next slide. Um, similar story with Saturn. So this was, uh, right now it's approaching and, and, and enlarging its size. This is 18.3 second diameter or 43 arc seconds with rings. It's uh, quite big in size. And um, why this, special, this picture is special is because it was taking last few weeks when we had this amazing seeing. The condition, seeing conditions were so amazing that not only it revealed the double nature of um, the rings, but each and, uh, and every channel for this image uh, taken from uh, uh, FLO Observatory actually had this distinct Cassini division in it. So this was again on um, June 21st. Uh, however, the bad news is that uh, Saturn and uh, Jupiter will not rise higher than 24, 22 degrees, and that will make the observation a little bit tricky because of uh, the air oscillations. Let's go to the next slide. And again, this is Jupiter, a uh, similar picture which I showed last time, but this is even more um, details uh, this time in the picture. and. Um, the red spot was turned towards us. So um, I managed to catch it when it was 18 point, oh sorry, 46 arc second diameter right now. And again, on July 16th, it's gonna be 47.6 arc seconds at its maximum size. Good uh, chance again to look at the details. After that, it will be getting away from us and shrinking in size. Um, let's go to the next slide. Oh yeah, so this is the close-up of uh, the planet with a two-time Barlow zoom. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, it shows a bit more uh, details. And again, only because the um, seeing was so great that I couldn't miss the chance, even though I took similar pictures before this, but uh, this was a special case. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Venus, uh, this is a similar to a previous, again, picture from the last month, but different in the sense that now it's on the different side of the sun. So it was uh, approaching the sun, setting up with the sun uh, during the sunset. Now it's actually uh, appearing in the sky before the sunrise, and it's getting farther and farther from the sun, which means it, it's rising earlier and earlier. However, its size is uh, getting smaller and smaller. So when this picture was taken, its diameter was, uh, I think it was uh, June, June 25th. So the diameter was 47 arc seconds. And let's go to the next slide. And yeah, this is a bit onboarding like planet stuff. So this is a new toy, uh, Star Adventurer. I tried it out again from the um, FLO Observatory. You can recognize the tree line. Uh, it's um, that right part, which is uh, pointing to the south, and uh, this is that part of Milky Way, which is the core of our galaxy. You can see the lagoon in the upper leftish corner, and uh, Triffid right about it, and a very, very far in a very uh, left upper corner, there is a trace of uh, Omega, that uh, red spot in, in the corner that's Omega uh, Nebula. Uh, and again, you can see the, the, the lanes of dust in our galaxy. Uh, indeed, as uh, Richard mentioned, it has this uh, brownish cast and uh, it's, um, I think this is quite uh, amazing to have a look at the core of our galaxy from relatively um, light polluted as it gets worse and worse place, but uh, it's still quite dark at FLO and uh, there is uh, still potential uh, for pictures. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah, and this is the, uh, the same region with um, 
Lagoon and Triffid Nebula, but this time it's taken with um, 135 millimeter lens uh, at f2. This is taken from some distant road um, south of uh, Pakenham uh, in a relatively dark place again, but uh, because it's a uh, uh, lens, camera lens, it's a bit wider field of view uh, compared to uh, close ups of telescopes but uh, more narrower compared to the pre previous picture, which was just taken with a regular key plans. That's all I have for tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Taras. Great pictures. Okay, okay so last month uh, we had the uh, beginner challenge and uh, M65 and intermediate of NGC 5529, NGC 6578 on the advanced challenge and the lunar challenge of crater Katharina. And uh, it's great to see some observations, folks following up on those challenges. So next slide, please. So uh, for this upcoming month, the beginner challenge is Messier 4. It's a globular cluster in Scorpius. It's around six magnitude, 26 uh, arc minutes apparent size. Next one. Intermediate challenge is NGC 6503, a spiral galaxy in Draco. 10th magnitude and brightness. Next slide. The advanced challenge is the emission nebula in Cygnus, also known as the propeller nebula. And uh, it's a very subtle object. We'll see if anybody can, uh, can get that. Next slide. Lunar challenge is, is Crater Wohler. It's a lunar impact crater located in the crater field of Rabi Levy. It's 27 kilometers wide and 2.1 kilometers deep. Next slide. So there's a summary of our challenges. These will all be in the astronauts uh, newsletter, which should be coming out shortly. Okay, so uh, for members, the Fred Lawson Observatory is open. Uh, currently we are restricted to uh, 10 people at a time. So uh, please uh, respect the social and physical distancing rules as they stand right now. Um, typically when folks are going out there, they email to our distribution list. And if you do plan to go out at the same time, please respond to everybody so that we can keep track of the, uh, of the numbers. Unfortunately, our books are locked up in the museum, so our library is closed. Uh, maybe sometime this fall, we'll be able to get back into our library. Here are the folks who uh, keep the uh, organization running. So we had a peak of 94 people out tonight. Thank you very much to all the uh, speakers. Uh, thank you to the RASC National Office who uh, gives us our webinar Zoom account for to allow us to do that. Any ideas, I'd love to hear them from you. So meeting chair at ottawa.rasc.ca. If you have ideas for talks or ideally if you have a talk to give, uh, that I would uh, really look forward to, to uh, hearing from you. Uh, next month, we have Paul Cloninger doing a, a, a session on astrophotography, but I do have space for uh, maybe a couple more things that aren't too long on, on the, in August. And in September, we have a special guest speaker from uh, Vancouver talking about uh, eye telescope. Next slide. Unfortunately, uh, we can't go to Grace O'Malley's. Maybe some point when we get to level three, we'll be able to do that and when we're meeting at the museum. So membership, uh, regular membership is $88. Family membership is $82.50 plus $15 an adult, $8.10 a youth. And um, youth membership is uh, $53, under 21 years or under 25 if you are a student. And the benefits of membership are as follows on the next slide. Oh, sorry, yes, if COVID is causing you financial pain on renewal of your membership, please email president at ottawa.rac.ca and we will try to help you with that, okay? So membership benefits, we have the Ted Bean Loan Library, it's our telescope loan library. We have the, uh, once we get back into the museum, we will have the, uh, our, our, uh, our library, regular book library. We have the Fred Lawson Observatory, which is out near Almont, and on the next screen. You also get uh, Sky News, which comes out every two months, uh, which is our national magazine for the Royal Astronomical Society. You get an electronic version of the journal, but you can also, for an additional cost, you can get a hard copy of that. You automatically get the Observer's Handbook each year, and we have our locally grown 
uh, marvelous newsletter called Astronauts, which is emailed out every month, uh, courtesy of Gord Webster. Our next meeting is August the 7th and uh, 7.30 p.m. It will still be a Zoom webinar. I encourage you to come out and again, any ideas, uh, please uh, feel free to contact me, meetingchair at ottawa.rasc.ca. Thank you for coming out tonight. Mm -hmm.